Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay. We're on the Real News Network, and we're continuing our series of discussions with Thomas Drake. You'll find his biography just below here, and I've read it out all the other times, so I'm not going to do it again, but just quickly, Thomas worked at the NSA, was a whistleblower, was charged with espionage, uh, eventually more or less beat the charges. You, you had to uh, agree to, well, Thomas is here in the studio. First of all, thanks again. Uh, you, you agreed to plead to what was amount to a misdemeanor? Was well, there's, there's quite a story behind it uh, in terms of how it all happened, but on my own terms, um, I pled out to a minor misdemeanor for exceeding authorized use of a computer under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The, um, with, the, with the proviso, they would drop all of the 10 felony counts from the indictment. No, and, we, and no fine and no jail time. So I uh, had one year probation uh, from the judge and 240 hours of community service, which, in which I ended up interviewing veterans from World War II to the present day. So let's, let's do the backstory. Because okay. you've you said several times that it's hard not to get just extremely cynical, I guess, about America, about the world, about life. Uh, but to feel like you're getting so cynical, you must have kind of believed in it in the first place. So kind of go back uh, in terms of you grew up in a house, your father's military, right? My father's a World War II veteran. He was a bombardier navigator, also flew missions oh, supported. Same, same with mine. He also flew missions supported of the OSS. He was the only man that got out of an airplane that went down in flames. Uh, he was behind the lines for six months. Mm -hmm. So he also lives with survivor's guilt. So, and he made the military, it's true, he was in the Strategic Air Command. So when the Air Force was created in 1947 as part of the National Security Act, um, he then rejoined the military uh, with the newly created Air Force after he got his uh, degree with the GI, the GI Bill. So you were a military kid. You grew up in, in the culture uh, of being... Born in Louisiana, moved to England. He was an exchange officer of the Royal Air Force, uh, moved back to Texas where he retired in the early 60s. And I was a very young child grow, growing up in Texas, a republic before it became a state, and then we moved to Vermont uh, shortly after he retired. And how would you describe the political culture of the House in terms of how they voted, what they believed in? Well, he, he was Americanism. How important was that? He was military. I mean, he was you know, it's you serve your country, you support your country. Um, he had spent a whole career, right? And the World War II veterans, in particular, I mean, that was sort of like the last last great war that mattered. Everything else since then has never been a war. In fact, that's the last time we even declared war. Congress declared war, which is only the only branch of government that has the prerogative of doing so. But we haven't done that since World War II. Um, so it was very much a kind of a or very orderly, to the T kind of a household. Father was a very difficult man to live with. You know, he, he had a lot of, a lot of uh, burdens that he carried himself, I think, just from his own history. That wasn't always easy dealing with him. You grow up believing that America fights for truth, justice, well, I mean, I'm now living in New England. Your daughter's American Revolution. I mean, it's you've for the center, of, you know, Ethan Allen, the you know, the Green Mountain Boys, you know, and it was a grand experiment. It was launched in 1789 you know, uh, when it was you know ratified. Uh, it took two years, but we now have a constitution. For all of its faults and foibles, that was this new form of government. You, you become a teen, or you enter your teens, the Vietnam War is still on? Vietnam War is still on. I actually remember as a freshman seeing seniors burning their draft cards in the back parking lot. Yeah. What did you think of that? Well, the Vietnam War at that point was, was, you know, it was part of the social revolution, and it was clearly uh, very negative. You know, it was a waste. It was... But did you feel that at the time, and how mind. did your father feel about it? Well, my father actually, in that period, he was first for it, and then became quite disillusioned, and and turned on the Vietnam War. And what about you? Yeah, same same with me. But see, I was the next generation. I was not part of the Vietnam generation. The Beatles are history for me. For me, it's Peter Frampton and Grand Funk, and you know the Bee Gees a year later. So we were. I graduated in 1975. We were. We were actually the first. Ye the first year of the non-Vietnam generation. And did you 
Uh, you were you were old enough to attend some protests. Did you ever get engaged in that way? Not then. That was all through television. That's that's how I saw it. I was not part of any protests during that time. I mean, in fact, those protests had taken place. That was all history for me. If you remember, I I was the the bulk of the protests that you're talking about, right? I was eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. Right? So. It was all history. Well, you're, you're born in 57. 57. So 67, you're 10. This yeah. pro this, the war certainly but going I was, on. I was growing up on a farm in Vermont. Yeah, not unaware. And of course, in high school, obviously, those classes ahead of me were very much against the war and were very much um, against you know, government abuse. And of but, course, you have to remember, I'm eyewitness. Uh, my civic awakening took place in the 70s, so I'm there with Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a young Hillary Rodham who was actually serving on the House Impeachment Committee, drawing up articles of impeachment. Uh, wa the, the, whole, uh, the whole Watergate with Berns you know, Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, you know, extraordinary set of events, and then seeing a president of the United States resign their office. I mean, it's quite something. And how much does that show? And all the abuses that came out from the Church and Pike Committee hearings. What possible justification was so they just, once again, is you can't trust, you can't trust authority. So why did you join the Air Force? That didn't happen right away. That happened in the late, the late 70s. It's not that much later. Well, 79. I had done a number of other things for four years after I graduated. Um, I decided that I would join the military for the experience. I wanted to see what it was like. I knew I wasn't going to make it a career. And I didn't. I did not actually make the military a career, although I served for two enlistments uh, during the Cold War. This kind of a, if you know, going back to some of the earlier conversation, this kind of a double track here. It's a, you're a contradictory man in some ways. I, I don't. I, That's we a all, fair statement. We, we, and we all are, but but you seem to be aware of the dark side of American power and the human condition, not just American power. Yet you're fighting, like you say, it's not the country I signed up to defend, meaning the Bush-Cheney Patriot Act era. It's, uh, but, but what is the country? I mean, is the country you, you're fighting for an abstraction and your actual the experience the abstraction is, the is something else? Uh, the abstraction is the Constitution. Now, you're probably the first person that's made that distinction. The abstraction is the piece of paper called the Constitution with a Bill of Rights. It mattered. That's the thing that mattered. As a, as a U.S. citizen, that's what mattered. And so I did not take those, that oath lightly to support and defend it against all enemies for domestic. What I didn't imagine is that I would find myself face to face in secret with my own government. That that would be the enemy. That the enemy would become, but then I would be turned into an enemy of the state by virtue of holding up the mirror and speaking truth to enough power. In your eyes, the state is actually the enemy of the Constitution. Actually, yes. The whole time, I, all I was doing was standing on it, defending it. Against my, as it turned out, against my own government. Now, if they're going to set aside the Constitution, then what does that mean for our form of governance as a people? I could make a very powerful argument as more than a passing student of history and politics, even having majored and minored in national security and history and, and government, right, and, and international relations with my first masters, I can make a very powerful argument that without a constitution, we're not America. And if we're not America, then we're not, then who we are as Americans. And you can also make a powerful argument that more or less the constitution is, is sent, uh, suspended in, in real terms at the establishment of the national security state. Actually, yes. Back in the, it was, in the 40s. It was, became subordinate. And in, Conditions created would, for it yes. by McCarthyism, House of Modern American Activities yes. Committee. That is the basis for, remember, 9-11 didn't just happen. The suspension of the Constitution that took place in secret after 9-11, for all intents and purposes, didn't just happen because of 9-11. They had already been suspending major parts of it in secret, executive orders, uh, regulations, other statutes, and, and oftentimes co uh, in cooperation with the Congress since 1947. I mean, Watergate went public, but yes. you don't do that kind of stuff unless you can do that, think you can do that kind yes. of stuff. But remember, that, but see, it's critical to understand me that that was my civic awakening. 
even the president was not above the law. Our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Even the president could lose his very office for violating the special oath that he took to preserve, protect, and defend. But he got caught in such a public way that it starts to reveal the way the deep, that dark, deep state works. Yes. So he has to be thrown under the bus. He effectively was, and I think it was a historical mistake for Ford to pardon him. I think he should have actually been put on trial. Well, that really would have opened up a, a can of worms. But Cheney was a critical player in ensuring that Ford pardoned Nixon. What's that story? He's chief of staff. The youngest chief of staff already had his first heart attack. And you know, we got to preserve the presidency for the future. He had said, if people actually go back and listen to Cheney in some years after that, he said, if I refine myself, in a position, I'm going to essentially restore what was lost as a result of the Nixon administration, because he always thought that Nixon got a raw deal. This is the idea, the imperial presidency. Yeah. And that's a very powerful argument. It's extremely appealing. It's, it's very seductive, especially in crisis. It doesn't matter if the government was part of it. It doesn't matter if the government was, didn't prevent the crisis. The fact that there is a crisis allows authoritarianism and autocracy to as assert itself. Uh, it's a little bit of a di distraction from talking about your history, but it's always, I've always thought, especially now, although they're not new, but these kind of television shows like Scandal, uh, I guess to some extent 24, there's a whole range of them now, which is kind of all about this dark, deep state and that's public, it's entertainment programming, it kind of makes it all really acceptable. Yes, it does. Normalizes it, actually. Makes it rather banal, to be quite frank about it. Just in the background. It all happens, so should be no surprises. It's not just entertainment, though. But hey, we're the elite, we're the ones in charge. You know, as Bush said after 9-11, Go to the mall and shop. Don't mourn, shop. That's Interesting your, that response, would be your patriotic it? duty. Yeah. Patriotic duty was to continue to be a consumer in the economy. Just be a consumer. You'll be happy. So, you joined the Air Force. What year did you join? 1979. You're in for how long? Uh, a little over nine years. Nine years? Two oh. enlistments. I went to, then I worked at the CIA for a short time as an imagery analyst. So I'm going to keep coming back to this, because you're already, a lot of your Americanism has been disillusioned. You, you've made the point of Watergate growing up in that Nixon era. Um, you're, why do you, st I, I keep asking you the same question, I'm sorry, but why do you... It was worth, the Americanism was worth defending until you can no longer defend it. That moment of truth for me, interesting enough, was actually in secret the first week in October of 2001. That's when you can say I was radicalized by the truth of Pandora's box. And that was? Well, as you use the phrase you put, right, in terms of the Constitution. So the con for all intents and purposes, I'm eyewitness to suspension of the Constitution. And that's the in institution secret. of mass surveillance. The mass surveillance regime in particular, knowing it was unleashed in an extraordinary way across the United States and rapidly metastasized. I was eyewitness to all of that. And I reported all of that to the 9-11, uh, the congressional 9-11 investigations, particularly the joint inquiry, all censored and suppressed. Not a word in the final report. The only evidence anybody can find to date after almost 13 years is that I was interviewed. Now, there's, there's two. There's 9-11 Commission, there's a joint congressional investigation. The, the JIC, yeah. 
Which one are we talking about? The, the joint inquiry, the congressional, with the House Intel and Senate Intel that committees. Bob Graham, was, who was yes, referred to earlier. That's was right. I was never actually uh, interviewed for the 9-11 Commission. Why? I, because I think my testimony was so explosive, it was smoking gun evidence of NSA's culpability. Yeah, just to remind people, we talked about this in an earlier segment, that the NSA actually had uh, eavesdropping hard evidence of the connection between these guys, two people, that, two guys that end up on the American Airlines flight in San Diego, and what was known as a Yemeni uh, switchboard for Al-Qaeda. Um, and I'm sure much more than that. Uh, oh, actually, far more. That was just one part of it. There was actually an entire intelligence report that they had done prior to months and months. It was actually in early 2001 that NSA refused uh, to allow it to go out for distribution to the rest of the community. And the analysts were beside themselves. I didn't find out about it until uh, shortly after 9-11 when it was brought to me. What was in it? The entire network that we knew at that time based on signals intelligence. The entire network that the winds entire up doing and associated the 9-11? movement, yes. Not every single hijacker, but most of them were known. Yes. Well, I got to return to something we talked about earlier. There's a back channel to Cheney. You can't sit on this stuff. Of course not. Well, watch the earlier That's segment. That's the other we, intelligence. We talked about this. That was the other intelligence network. He couldn't trust what was set up from 1947 on. This is one of the ironies of history. Cheney himself could not trust the, the early alert and warning system that had been put into place in 1947 in which we would never have another electronic Pearl Harbor. He unless, had, unless you want one. Well, he so, knew it would take something like that. I'll just, we're going to put it right on the table again because we keep saying it. He knew it would take something like a 9-11 in the 21st century for Americans to just cede to the government whatever was necessary to deal with whatever happened. To give this... Pearl back. Harbor did to, for us, for our entry into World War II, what 9-11 did in terms of what was unleashed in secret. That included mass surveillance, that included the torture regime. Now, the, the, and everything else. The political leadership of both parties, as we keep hearing from various people, including Cheney and Hayden, they're all briefed into all this. Yes. So both parties' leadership, they, they're all, they all know this is going on. Yes. And on the House Intel Committee, uh, Porter Goss and Nancy Pelosi were briefed in at a high level in terms of what was happening. That's why, remember what she said, you know, impeachment was taken off the table. She herself said that. I should tell you something. Although he clearly had violated his own oath, clearly had committed acts that rise to the level of impeachment. Bush. Yes. But national security was the protecting mechanism. Now, he was uh, doing it for the good of the nation. Now I go back to kind of what is it about people like you, and, and I'd, I'd include in some ways uh, he didn't suffer the consequences you did, but even a Bob Graham, I mean Bob Graham's head of the Senate Foreign Intelligence Committee, I mean he could keep his mouth shut, go back to Florida, have a comfy life. Most do. He, yeah, most do. He didn't have to write a book calling for Bush's but impeachment. He did. But he did. But he did. So what is it about you guys that just You grow won't a conscience or you had one. You're also staring at history. You know, remember, the way I have put it, I'll say it a different way. You open up Pandora's box, which happened to me. The Pandora's box is opened up, and I'm staring into it, and the abyss is staring back at me. You could close Pandora's box or just look, us, look away and act as if nothing was different because you didn't give the orders, you weren't the authorizer, you didn't make all the decisions. And that's how Germany gets to a Hitler, and that's how various places get to police states. And Interesting you say it that way. That's why I'm burdened by history. Remember, I am burdened by the dark chapters of the 20th century. I'm burdened by my own father's history from World War II. I'm burdened by what happened during the Cold War. I'm burdened by having listened in for years and years and years on the East German surveillance and police state. You can imagine what it meant in those days, weeks, and months after 9-11, confronted on a far vaster scale the United States was using the Stasi playbook 
to put place in secret a mass surveillance regime, which later became known as the Collect It All. Justification from General Alexander. Collect it all? We just need it all. They, they told me that in early October. We just need it. We just need it. We just need the data. We just need the data. Doesn't matter how we get it. Doesn't matter where it comes from. We just need the data. So in some ways, it was sort of the pathological response. We did fail. We can't admit we failed. We're using it as a convenient excuse to suspend the Constitution, Fourth Amendment, and guess what? We get to unleash all these powers. But we have, to, just in case, because we quote unquote missed the data, right? And I say that in quotes, we just got to get all the data. Okay, in the next As if that's the answer, which actually makes it worse. You're actually creating greater insecurity, not more security. Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the next segment. Please join us for the continuation of our interview with Thomas Drake on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.